Hello, I'm Gary Stearman. Welcome to Skywatch TV. With me on stage today, Dr. Michael Lake, author of this book, The Shinar Directive. Dr. Lake has written this book, and I think it is a must read if you're really interested in Bible prophecy. Dr. Lake is a founder and chancellor of Biblical Life College and Seminary, and welcome to Skywatch TV. How are you? I'm doing great, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here. This book, The Shinar Directive, let's talk about the title, Shinar. Uh, maybe a lot of people have read the Bible, they might have heard the word. What does it mean? The Valley of Shinar is where Nimrod, I believe, made a plan against the works of God in the earth. And it is ground zero for everything Luciferian. It's ground zero for every mystery religion. It's ground zero for many of the things that are even happening in the world today. And so for us to understand the dynamics spiritually, economically, politically, in every area, based upon what's going on in the earth, we have to go back to the Valley of Shinar. Now, you're really interested in Bible prophecy, and you believe that it's vital that, that today's Christian understand Bible prophecy. The Shinar Directive, by the way, I've read the book, extremely informative. It leads you right along and has some amazing information in it. It's all about Nimrod, a guy named Nimrod. Today, we sort of devalue that name. If a guy goes fishing, he's a Nimrod or something like that. But Nimrod was really an important character in the Bible. Let's talk about him for a minute. You know, the, he just, in a sense, almost has just a footnote in Genesis. But yet what the Hebrew represents there is that Nimrod did something very specific. Hmm. That when he became a mighty hunter before the Lord, that he was able to corrupt himself to become something else. That he would not only hunt men and draw them away from God, but he was going to hunt to destroy the very works of God in the earth today. Yeah, you used the word became. He became something. Now, a lot of people think, well, Nimrod might have been a powerful man, a charismatic character. Uh, now, in the book, you go much farther than that, as a matter of fact, and point out that Nimrod may have had some almost supernatural qualities. Laid within the Hebrew, it almost gives us the, the idea that he became something. He, uh, whether it was a Nephilim or, or some type of hybrid, he was able to transform or transfigure himself. Nimrod, when you look at the mystery religions, you look at all of esoteric knowledge, he's their poster child. Mm. He's their aspiration. They want to achieve what Nimrod did, uh, whether it's Freemasonry, the OTO, or all these various organizations. They aspire to not only emulate what he did, but to try to replicate it in their own lives. Mm -hmm. Now, when you read the histories, the ancient histories of the world, and I'm talking about secular history, uh, you read about mighty men. You read about men of valor, uh, the demigods of old, the, uh, the, the, those people who, who were dictators, uh, who essentially, essentially possessed supernatural powers. And it almost seems to me that you would rank Nimrod in, in that group of people, a, a man with almost supernatural powers. Many Christian commentators would categor, you know, category or categorize him in that same menu, uh, venue. Uh, they said that he was a Nephilim, that he was also even a hunter of giants, that he would hunt the Nephilim to bring them under his control for the things that he aspired to do. Hmm. And I think that we in Christianity have underestimated him and I believe that influence was embedded into the church on purpose to obscure what the occult are really doing. So, Shinar is a place, the Shinar Directive, uh, Shinar being a place, what's the directive that you talk about in the title? The directive is not only to draw men away from God, but a war against God himself. Uh, we find this uh, alluded to both in uh, Jubilees, the book of Yasher, we, we find it uh, even in, in many mythological writings, they were talking about those that aspired to whether Storm Olympus or whatever uh, within that culture they would call heaven to, to war against the gods themselves. And so I, I believe that is embedded in who Nimrod was and, and what his directive is. Uh, it's all leading to the Valley of Armageddon and that last great war. Mm -hmm. Now, when you talk about Armageddon, you're talking about the book of Revelation. <clears throat> yes. So, we look back at Nimrod, we look forward to Armageddon, and here we are in the middle. We are Christians living in a very significant period of history, and I want to just sort of break off uh, mo a moment and, and talk about today's Christianity, uh, the Christianity of 2014, 2015. 
uh, we as Christians read the Bible and we notice if we, if, if we read it deeply that a lot of very important material has, has been left out of, of mainstream Bible studies, particularly the supernatural aspect. Uh, and that leads us to an understanding of Bible prophecy. And I know that in this book, the Shinar Directive, that's sort of the tack you take. You, your attitude is, well, it's time really uh, to quit looking the other way and, and to really perceive uh, what this means for us living in the world today uh, perhaps the days leading up to the Antichrist himself. We're going to have to return to a Book of Acts church that understood not only what really unfolded in the past, but understand the dynamic of what we're living today. Mm -hmm. uh, as an educator, uh, I am kind of uh, taken back by just the lack of understanding of Bible prophecy within most of the ministry. Mm -hmm. Uh, how that most Christians don't understand it, they avoid it. It has all become here now, this moment, and, and that which I'm living in, in my own flesh, rather than seeing the grand scope of everything. It's time for us to wake up. We're, we're, we're a generation that we're not pondering if, if prophecy is going to begin to unfold. Right now it is unfolding at such a rapid rate, we can't keep up with it, those of us that are trying. With every scientific breakthrough, the elite are using that for a purpose toward the Shinar Directive. Mm -hmm. with, with every geopolitical move that we see today, it's for a purpose behind the scenes that they're moving toward the Shinar Directive. So we're asleep. Absolutely. And we're, I suppose, economically asleep, you know, uh, thinking that everything is all right economically. We're politically asleep. I think a lot of people would say that. Religiously, spiritually, we're asleep. Perhaps even people going to church are asleep. And uh, I get the idea that you'd like to wake them up. I'd like to wake them up. In fact, a lot of them not only need to wake up, they need to get saved. Mm. Uh, I had a student that was a Baptist pastor for a number of years and ended up in a hard situation. And while he was sitting in jail, he realized he wasn't saved. Wow. That we have easy believism instead of a transformative experience with the power of God and the power of the cross that goes to the, uh, the very core of your being is what we need to experience. It's going to take that kind of relationship to be able to combat what the enemy is doing in the world today. Now, having said all that as a kind of preface, let's go back to the Shinar Directive. Uh, everybody's heard about Mystery Babylon. Uh, the great mother of harlots at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, uh, the great wars that are coming, uh, the judgments of God in the day of the Lord, <clears throat> the uh, mystery Babylon, the, 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 the harlot who, who rides the beast. And all of this is kind of obscured in mysticism. I, I, maybe we don't understand what that means or whether it's even relevant to us. <clears throat> And yet your book, I think, goes a long way toward showing the relevancy of all these figures going all the way back to Nimrod, all the way forward to Mystery Babylon. It's the same system, right? It's the same system, and I think it's the very <coughs> source of who we're having to do warfare against. We need to understand that Mystery Religion Babylon predates Christianity, it even predates Judaism. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, not only is it fighting against us, it's constantly working to infiltrate, to water down the gospel, to water down our belief systems, and to put us to sleep. Mm -hmm. And asleep we are. Okay, let's, let's talk about specifics now. <clears throat> this Nimrod was a dictator, as, as I understand. Uh, he was uh, a man who, in fact, wished to control the entire uh, world. He was backed... Uh, as you put it in your book, by Lucifer. Lucifer had a plan. It, it was a sort of a game plan, if you will. Let's talk about that a little bit, the power behind Nimrod, uh, how it manifested itself through the Old Testament era and on into uh, of the present day. Uh, when you, we use the term Luciferian, which you do often in your book, what are you talking about? Luciferianism is a religion uh, we wouldn't, you know, some people say, well, it's the same as Satanism. It isn't. They view Lucifer as the good God. Hmm. They believe that he co-created the universe along with Yahweh. 
and that he wanted more for man than Yahweh did, and he was going to give him the knowledge to ascend into godhood. Hmm. And that's when Yahweh intervened and said, no, I'm not going to do that. And so within, within most of Luciferianism, it's all about gaining, once again, that knowledge that was promised in the Garden of Eden to ascend into godhood. And so we, we run across terms like apotheosis, ascension. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that is the core belief of, of Freemasons. It's the core belief of transhumanism. Uh, they're even becoming braggadocious about the fact that one day they're going to be able to manufacture gods. Well, we read about the Antichrist, and in your book you draw a connection between Nimrod as a, as a being and the Antichrist as a being. And, and they may have the, uh, the common uh, genetic uh, disposition, if you will, uh, of being somewhat beyond the ordinary human. Uh, transhuman is the word that's used today. I think not only transhuman as far as what he does physically. Uh, if you read in the book of Enoch that what we call demons are actually disembodied Nephilim spirits. Mm-hmm. If he was able to become a Nephilim, then he's neither in hell, he's neither in heaven, he's looking for a, a place to reincarnate. Mm-hmm. And it very well may be the Antichrist himself will be that, that Nephilim spirit who was Nimrod re-enter into this vessel specifically genetically designed for him. Well, Paul says very clearly in Second Thessalonians that this man of sin is going to stand up in the Holy of Holies and declare that he's God. Now, if I did that, they would put a straitjacket on me and carry me away. I mean, the ordinary man, I don't think, can just stand up and say, I'm God, and be believed. So this man must have special attributes of some sort. And I, you talk quite a bit about this in your book. I, I think he will have supernatural abilities that the uh, modification of his DNA, I, th- I think that even the, our spirit is encoded into our DNA. There's a lot that they call junk DNA that I, I believe is not junk at all. Mm. It's just simply parts they don't understand that governs whether our soul or governs our spirit. And so by modifying that in a transhumanist body, he's able to access in other dimensions and other realms and, and to be able to produce miracles and other things that we would, we would deem unhuman that he'll be able to move into because of the, of the modification of his DNA. You know, it's interesting as you're talking, I'm thinking the whole Bible really is about genetics, the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent, the seed being the genome and, and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ incarnating uh, uh, and so that his perfect uh, genome could then act as the one who could carry our sins and redeem us. In other words, it's all about genetics. In fact, by faith, we have received, if you will, a new life in Christ. And is that a metaphor, or have we actually become new creatures? I think, you know, the transhumanist is looking for homo noeticus. And uh, I'm here to tell them that homo noeticus has been here for 2,000 years. Every time someone's born again, we become new. And uh, the, the final war that we're going to see is Jesus is the seed of the woman that was prophesied. Almighty God said that there's also going to be the seed of the serpent, yes. which is Nimrod, which will come back as the Antichrist. And so it will be those associated with one seed or the other in the final war. And so when we're talking about the new life in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is no mere metaphor. This no. is a real uh, rebirth. It's, uh, being born again is, is not simply conversation. It's something that really happens. And when we're born again, uh, we're sort of lifted out of this domain of sin. And, you know, when I read your book, I really get a, a, re- a sense of relief. That was one of the things that hit me when I read this book. I, I am so relieved that I have new life in Christ. That is, I'm no longer subject to all of the evil things that are going on in this world. But believe me, they're going on, and and this book will uh, uh, illustrate them in a way that I think you'll find very interesting. Now, let's let's talk again about the plan, the directive, because a lot of your book is kind of aimed at sensitizing people to what this directive is in, in the present day. I believe that the directive has been going on for 5,000 years. I believe they calculated a lot of of introducing things into history based upon what they knew were coming. Like when you read the book of Enoch, 
Uh, they knew the watchers were going to be bound up for 70 years. I believe that the elite have been planning for the last five, for the last 5,000 years for the releasing of the watchers because there was a release of technology that comes with the watchers that they had to have for their end game. We look at the explosion of technology since the 1900s, mm. uh, which fall right in line with about the time that the watchers would have been released. Mm -hmm. uh, we can find uh, nuances of their involvement with Nazi Germany and their technological advances and how that after uh, Germany was never meant to win World War II. It was meant to be defeated so that those Nazi scientists could be seeded into the other nations and begin to take that Luciferian concept and that technology of what the Watchers could give and to all the other nations of the earth. And in fact, a lot of those scientists came to America and, and went into the upper ranks of research in, in, our, uh, in our country. Uh, the vaunted halls of academe uh, housed a lot of uh, refugees from that part of the world who had belonged to those occult societies. societies and they, I guess they brought a lot of that in, into our hemisphere after World War II. Well, that's why we see with the NASA programs, with the CIA, and even in the military, they will use daunting, pagan-sounding names. Why was the mission to the moon called Apollo? Uh, Apollo. Or Gemini? Yeah. Uh, Apollo is mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, uh, as uh, the god of destruction. Uh, he is, uh, shall we say, rather infamous. He's the one released out of the abyss. Yeah. And so, yeah, a good question. Why would we name a project Apollo? Only if you had another goal in mind. Mm. Maybe that was not given to the public. So you believe that behind the things we see is basically another world, a world of... Now, I hate to use the term conspiracy or conspiratorialism or anything like that because people instantly kind of react negatively. Oh, you know, I've heard a dozen people talk about conspiracies and they never come to anything. But I think you demonstrate in the book, and I have been sensitized to this many years back, as have a lot of other Christians, and I hope in growing numbers, but yeah. we've been sensitized to the fact that... Um, there really is something happening back there where you can't see it. And it's something that's been going on for a long, long time. Anytime you've been in government service or military, you understand the intelligence community. Uh, you also understand what I call the Game of Thrones in that we have intelligence communities because there are nations conspiring against us behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And so we have got to detect what they're doing and then we come up with our own conspiracies against them. Uh, if you could ever step back behind that, you would realize that there's an elite group that are controlling all the nations. Mm -hmm. And so that in this dichotomy of, of us being against the Soviet Union or us being against, you know, during the Cold War, uh, both sides develop technologies that the elite are using. It doesn't matter which nation uh, develops them during the struggle, they all have access to them. Hmm. Now, you used the term Nephilim a minute ago. This is a a term that we're hearing more and more often in Christian circles these days, positively and negatively. Uh, there are a lot of people who say, that's a sidetrack. Don't, don't mention the Nephilim. They have nothing to do with modern Christianity. And besides that, it's a myth. Uh, th there's a whole wing of the modern Christian church that, that believes that, uh, for example, the sons of God who intermarried with the daughters of men in Genesis 6 were actually the, the descendants of Seth. They were not fallen angels. And so we have an ongoing Christian debate today as to whether dark forces from above actually uh, interbred with early humanity. And my reaction to this is to try to clarify it. And I know that's your reaction too. So somebody's out there right now, there, and you've used the term Nephilim. Uh, Explain that, clarify it in your terms. In the Word of God, Nephilim is a hybridization. Uh, the original wave, if you will, was, was angels mating with human women. Uh, what's interesting about that, prior to the uh, Sethite theory about uh, 300, 325 AD, uh -huh. uh, with Julius Africanus, all the early church fathers, all the rabbis within Judaism, all understood Genesis 6 to be angels coming down and mating with women. Mm -hmm. That was universally accepted. Uh, when you really look at the text, and, and the, the second hybridization program was the blending of species to create something other. And that really falls in line with what I said. I don't think we're going to have another reoccurrence of angels coming down and mating with women. 
I think that God put the put the stop to that with the with the with the uh, the flood that He changed the atmosphere and the, and the physiology of man to make that impossible. But they are looking for ways to replicate this blending of species to create something other than human that can bear the mark of the beast. But interdimensional interlopers, if you will, are a big part of the narrative of the Bible. And in fact, Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. His minions uh, apparently invisibly are moving back and forth and doing their evil deeds all the time. And in my opinion, they're coming closer and closer to the earth uh, as we enter the, the period of the last days. Their efforts are quickening. They're probably... Uh, bringing their programs of, uh, of undermining humanity, bringing those programs close to conclusion, even as we speak. And there's a reality there. Uh, and I really think that that's much of the motivation behind your book, uh, that to, to give people a sense of that reality. To get a sense of that reality, I mean, we live in a multiverse. Ah. Uh, that there's, the Bible talks about the third heaven, the second heaven, and the first heaven is our dimensional reality. And I think as we approach the last days that those veils are going to become thinner mm -hmm. uh, so that we're going to see more. And I also believe that we're going to have to redefine what it means to be a Christian. We may have to redefine what it means to be human if, if some of these people have their way. But we need to realize that it's not just being born again. I've been birthed into a new kingdom, and that new kingdom is, is, is not no longer a part of that kingdom of darkness. And I need to learn how as a citizen of that kingdom to stand in who I am in Christ, to, to understand my authority, to understand how that kingdom functions, and to understand how I am set here to oppose that other kingdom. And my job is to steal back the ones that they're hunting and pulling away from God. Mm. Hunting. Uh, Nimrod was a hunter. Yes. A, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Talk about that just a little bit, because that doesn't mean he went out and killed wild animals, does it? No, it doesn't. Uh, in, in fact, in the Hebrew, it literally means that he went out and did it in the face of God. That he was doing what he did in defiance of God. That he, that he created the mother of all systems mm. to lure men away from the one true God and pull them into a system to keep them away from salvation, uh, to, to, to bring them under slavery to him. And that, that's still that world system today. That's, Satan is, is out there to pull every human being off this planet away from God, away from the gospel, away from the reality of the kingdom of God, and to pull them together in his war against God. Okay, I have a question. Are we living in the last days? Absolutely. And somebody's watching right now uh, and, and saying, well, I'm not really sure that's true. Uh, what would you say to that person? Turn on your evening news. Mm. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you read the book of Revelation at all, you can begin seeing the manifestation of what is being spoken of in the book of Revelation in the evening news. Uh, I had a student that had a man walk out of his church service angry because he was teaching from the book of Revelation and saying one day people are going to be beheaded for their faith. Mm. Uh, all you got to do is turn on the evening news to find out that that is happening and unprecedented numbers in modern history throughout the Middle East, mm -hmm. and even reports in America that we're beginning to see this happen. Uh, you, you have to purposely be blind not to see that we're in the end days, and that we're beginning to see prophecy unfold with a clarity that probably no other generation has ever been able to see. Of course, we uh, watch the developments in the Middle East, ISIS, we go all the way back to 1947, 48, the birth of Israel. A lot of people have commented on that over the last uh, 60 years or so. Uh, soon, Israel's going to be 70 years old. You know, that's a long time uh, for things to have been brewing the way they're brewing in the Middle East. And, and people have watched this, and they've said, this is going to go on forever. Uh, there's no end to it. But the Bible says it's all going to come to an amazing conclusion. How soon do you think? Probably within the next five to 15 years, we're, we're going to see so much of this unfold. Uh, never before did we have the possibility of a nuclear Iran or, or, or nuclear weaponry falling into the hands of these terrorists. Mm. That changes the dynamic geopolitically worldwide. Wow. You're listening to Dr. Michael Lake, and, and I'd like to offer his book to you right now. We'll talk about it. The Shinar Directive. You heard about Shinar. We've talked about the directive. Uh, the 
information in this book uh, relative to, uh, if you will, an underground conspiracy that extends right into our own day is amazing. Uh, it's educational, and, and I think Dr. Uh, Lake has put together some ideas that will stimulate your imagination. Uh, call the number on your screen, order the Shinar Directive. Uh, 1995 is the price, and with it, absolutely free, comes a free data DVD. Uh, what's, uh, what's the information contained on the data DVD? I tried to compile a library that would just help Christians, and so we have about 128 books that are PDF that range from classic Christian reference mm -hmm. works uh, to books on Freemasonry, UFO, mind control, uh, the Illuminati that they can look at. We've, uh, I've included uh, five different lecture series that I have done complete with study guides. There's about 40 hours of MP3, as well as several Bible programs that will help them in their studies. If you've ever thought that maybe there are things going on that you don't completely understand, let me recommend the book, The Shinar Directive, yours for 1995, with the free data DVD that has a lot of reading material, a lot of research material, uh, I think uh, what Dr. Lake is trying to do, and by the way, I join you in this, is awaken a sleeping generation to something that's going on, something, sadly, it's dark and, and it's ominous, but we're not without hope, right? Absolutely. You know, the Bible, one of, the, the, one of my favorite prophecies, I think it's in Isaiah, says when this great gross darkness comes, worse than, than humanity has ever seen, that God's light will come on us. And I think we could be that generation. Now, what should we look for in the light of this book, The Shinar Directive? What should we be watching for as we watch the evening news, read the papers, read magazines, watch the Internet? What are we looking for today in terms of the background motions of these people you describe who are trying to recreate the land of, and, and the world of Nimrod? I think they're going to need chaos. And the more that we see chaos that, that moves across many nations, that gives them an excuse to reboot, whether it's economical or, or geopolitical, they're going to look for something that we're going to have to draw back and get away from national borders and to bring out something new. Uh, when, when we begin seeing that, we know the time's near. They have their hands in politics. They have their hands in international finance. They have their hands in false religion. And uh, they're busily at work right now. Yes, they are. The Shinar Directive, Dr. Michael Lake, thanks for being with us today. It's been a pleasure, Gary. And may the Lord bless your work. Thank you. I'm Gary Stearman for Skywatch TV. Keep watching, everybody.